Welcome everybody. Hello to all that are joining us by Zoom and on the Facebook stream. Thank you for joining to this first webinar of the European Choral Association in 2023. My name is Yoji Vok and I am an assistant for regional development and data collection at the European Choral Association and I'm also responsible for trainings and educational programs. As we are recording and streaming the webinar on Facebook, I would like to ask everyone who does not want their face to be seen to turn off the camera. And I would kind of ask everyone to be muted during the session. So today, I think we will be all learning something new about collective singing and intangible cultural heritage. We will listen to Celia Fischer from International Music Council Yanis Ozos from Lithuanian Song Celebration and Eva Krevečkaite from International Latvian Song Celebration. I warmly welcome all three presenters. But before we give the word to our guests, I would like to invite our Secretary General Sonia Greiner to say some opening words and to present us the project under which this webinar is held today. Sonia, hello. Hello and welcome everybody. I've just been scanning the list of participants and I'm really happy to see some people I haven't seen in a long time and also to discover some new people I think I have never seen in any of our webinars before. So I'm very happy to welcome you. Um, um, I will tell you a bit more about Ignite in a moment, maybe just to say why did we choose uh, to do a webinar about intangible heritage? Um, um, there has been a lot of talks about cultural heritage uh, in the last years and the European Union did an EU year on cultural heritage. But we have the feeling that um, often when people speak about heritage, they only have the tangible heritage in mind. So they think about museums, they think about archaeology, um, about stones and walls. Um, but there is a big part of cultural heritage that is the so-called intangible heritage. And if you have never come across these words, it kind of means that it's heritage that you cannot touch. But Celia Fischer will probably tell you more about that later. And so we thought that it would be nice to um, do something, do a webinar on this topic. And I am very happy that Celia Fischer um, will be able to give us an introduction since she's an expert on this topic and that we will then hear about probably the most stunning examples from the collective singing um, sector um, uh, from the Baltic countries. So, Yoji, um, maybe next slide. For those who are um, at the webinar for the first time, this webinar is taking place in the frame of a project or as part of a project called IGNITE, Igniting an Inclusive and Sustainable Future for Collective Singing Throughout Europe. It's um, a project that is co-funded by the European Union uh, Creative Europe program under the network strand. 
And we started in December 2021 and the project will end in November 24. And the main aims of the project are to contribute to the European Green Deal, increase diversity, inclusion and equity and empower and train people in the sector um, also making use of modern technology and obviously this webinar is part of um, training people in the sector on different topics. Um, so under the um, keyword of training, we are offering at least two webinars each year. So we already did two last year and you will hear later how you can find um, our earlier webinars on, on our YouTube channel, I think. And um, if not, you can just go and have a look. And we do a physical training workshop at each um, membership weekend in November of each year. And um, next slide, I think I will hand back over to um, my colleague Yoji now um, to start the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. But before we go to our presenters, I would just like to say a few words about how the session will work. So first about questions. There will be an opportunity to ask questions after each presentation and of course a more detailed discussion can be also after all three presentations uh, but i think that janis also will have to leave us because he has a rehearsal in the evening so in zoom please just raise your hand to ask uh, uh, your question and uh, in chat it's also possible to write and type them in whenever you think it's appropriate and we will uh, read them in the Facebook stream. You can also ask your questions in the comments and those will be passed to us in the Zoom. And now I guess we are finally ready to start with our presentations. Um, first, I would like to invite Miss uh, Celia Fisher from International Music Council to present us UNESCO's view on intangible cultural heritage and how collective singing and singing is a part of it. Celia, welcome. Um, the word is yours. Thank you very much, Josie. Good morning, good afternoon or evening, everyone uh, from wherever you connect to this webinar. It is a true pleasure to be here today with you. And I would first like to thank the European Choral Association for their kind invitation. I'm truly honored to speak uh, uh, at this webinar. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. And I will have the pleasure to discuss with you the topic of collective singing and UNESCO's intangible cultural heritage. Uh, as Josie said, I am the Secretary General of the International Music Council which is the world's largest and also the most inclusive network of music organizations and institutions dedicated to the advancement of essential music rights for all people. We stand for a world where everyone can enjoy access to music, where they can learn, experience, create, perform, and express themselves through music, and a world in which artists of every kind are recognized and fairly remunerated. This is our vision. IMC's network spans 150 countries on all continents with national music councils and international, regional and national music organizations, as well as specialized organizations in the fields of arts and culture. And we're very happy and proud that the European Power Association is part of this global network. Through our members, the International Music Council has access to over 1,000 individual organizations and 600 million people that are eager to develop and to share knowledge and experience on diverse aspects of musical life. In addition to its large geographical scope, the IMC network also represents an unparalleled body of knowledge across the music sector from music education to media, from live music to music publishing, from creation to research, from amateur music making to traditional expression. The International Music Council was founded by UNESCO in 1949, and we are recognized today as an official NGO partner. And in this capacity, we attend UNESCO meetings at, as observers and this allows us to be quite well versed in UNESCO's definitions and frameworks in the field of culture policy, 
which brings me to speak today to you. Our partnership with UNESCO has many operational aspects, and as we talk today about intangible cultural heritage, some of you may know that UNESCO launched its collection of traditional music recordings in the early 1960s in collaboration with the International Music Council. The UNESCO collection stands as one of the earliest achievements of both UNESCO's and IMC's program for the safeguarding and revitalization of intangible cultural heritage. Regarding the so-called normative work of UNESCO, the conventions are key. A convention is an international policy document which reflects obligations and commitments that governments, and they are called parties to the convention, undertake. What brings me today here is actually the 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage, which was adopted on the, on the 17th of October 2003 by the UNESCO General Conference. That's why we refer to this convention as the 2003 Convention. Now, let's have, let's have a look at how UNESCO defines intangible cultural heritage in this convention. The convention defines the concept of intangible heritage as the practices, representations, expressions, knowledge, and skills, as well as the instruments, objects, artifacts, and cultural spaces associated therewith that communities, groups, and in some cases, individuals recognize as part of their cultural heritage. And I think we will have this definition on our screen soon. So once again, it defines the concept of intangible heritage as the practices, the representation, the expression, knowledge, skills, as well as the instruments, objects, artifacts, and cultural spaces associated therewith that communities, groups, and in some cases, individuals recognize as part of their cultural heritage. The, so these, this is the definition. Uh, the intangible cultural heritage, uh, one back, Yoshi, please. Okay. Intangible cultural heritage is transmitted from generation to generation. This is a very important aspect. It is constantly recreated by communities and groups in response to their environment their interaction with nature and the history and provides them with a sense of identity and continuity, thus promoting respect for cultural diversity and human creativity. So the key points here are really transmission from generation to generation, this constant recreation by on within communities in response to their living environment and it also its heritage uh, these are expressions that provide these communities and these groups with a sense of identity and continuity next slide please within this definition intangible cultural heritage which can be seen here on this slide as a very intricate network of expressions uh, can be among others also in the following domains. Next slide, please. So first, the oral traditions and expressions. This includes language as a vehicle of the intangible cultural heritage. Some examples of this are um, fairy tales, legends, and regional languages. Performing arts, such as vocal and instrumental music, dance and theater, Pantomime, pantomime and sung verse. Third, social practices, rituals, and festive events like worship rites, rite of passage, passage, birth, wedding, and funeral rituals, oath and allegiance, 
traditional legal system, traditional games and sports, as well as the physical elements such as special gestures and words, uh, recit recitations, songs or dances, special clothing, processions, animal sacrifice, and special food. The fourth is knowledge and practices concerning nature and the universe. This includes traditional ecological wisdom, indigenous knowledge about local fauna and flora, traditional healing systems, rituals, beliefs, initiatory rites, cosmology, shamanism, possession rites, social organizations, festivals, languages, and visual arts. And finally, traditional craftsmanship. Here we talk about the skills and knowledge involved in craftsmanship rather than the craft products themselves. So it's about how to make tools, how to make clothing, how to make jewelry, costumes, and, and the props for the festivals and performing arts uh, representation, and also musical instruments are included here. Music and specifically collective singing is integrated here under performing arts, but it's important to view all these domains as being complementary. You will have heard words that actually um, refer also to collective singing and music in, in some other uh, domains. So intangible cultural heritage is pretty transversal and at times more than one of these domains can be present at once. An extremely interesting aspect of this UNESCO definition of intangible cultural heritage is the central role it grants to communities in the recognition of what is for them their own intangible heritage. Indeed, there can only be an attribution of the label of heritage when it is recognized as such by the communities, by the groups, or or individuals that create, maintain, and transmit it. Without their recognition, nobody else can decide for them that a given expression or practice is their heritage. Within this definition, cultural heritage thus extends beyond monuments and collection of objects to also include traditions or living expressions. These oral traditions performing arts, social practices, rituals, festive events, knowledge and practices concerning nature and the universe, or the knowledge and skills to produce traditional crafts are inherited from our ancestors and they are passed on to our descendants. There is also a contemporary component to intangible heritage. It does not only represent inherited, inherited traditions, it also dialogues with the present. And it's also interesting to point out that intangible cultural heritage contributes to social cohesion because it strengthens and encourages a sense of identity. It helps individuals to feel part of the communities and to feel part of society at large. Its value lies in the community. It brings together, it ties together and it depends on those whose knowledge of tradition, skills, and customs are passed on to the rest of the community once again from generation to generation. The focus is not necessarily on the cultural manifestation itself, but rather on the wealth of knowledge and the wealth of skills that is transmitted through it. These practices are an important factor in maintaining cultural diversity also in the face of globalization, and they help promote intercultural dialogue, encouraging mutual respect for every culture and for other ways of life. Now, how can we situate music in this constellation with all the, the listings of intangible cultural heritage domains? Um, in Regarding the domains, uh, you will notice that they are organized around uh, aggregating fields. Uh, uh, 
for example, cost, uh, costumes and festivals or dance and vocal music, it is important to note that the listing is not exclusively tied to one of these fields, as I've said. And in reality, uh, they develop through this truly intricate web of relations with different aspects and fields of intangible cultural heritage. So when I say listing, this refers to the list of uh, uh, the UNESCO uh, convention. And uh, there is a list of representative works. There's also a list of uh, works that are uh, endangered. So how about music in this um, definition? Music is an important part of UNESCO's definition of intangible heritage as a vehicle, vehicle of transmission of cultural knowledge, traditions and values from one generation to the next one. Musical expressions are true bearers of cultural identities and they play a tremendous role in strengthening cultural identity. You remember the, the criteria for the definition of uh, cultural heritage, intangible cultural heritage is also to be a bearer of cultural identities. Uh, they play, um, sorry, as mentioned before, music is an essential part of many cultural expressions and can also be often intertwined with other cultural practices uh, alongside dance, storytelling, ritual, communities can express their unique identity, values, and traditions, and work towards social cohesion through music. Music is maybe not an universal language, as some of us like to say, but it is a truly universal art form that can be found in nearly every society, often as an integral part of other forms of performing art and intangible cultural practices. It has the ability to convey a wide range of emotions and it can be used for a variety of purposes, whether religious or secular in religious or secular contexts, whether in classical or popular settings, or even work for work or entertainment. There can be also a political or economic dimension to music. It can serve as a means to document the community's history to pay tribute to powerful figures or facilitate economic transactions. The occasions on which music is performed are just as varied, ranging from marriages, funerals, rituals and initiations, festivities, all kinds of entertainment, as well as many other social functions. Speaking now specifically about choral music or collective singing, I will just first mention that while I will continue to speak of choral singing or collective singing, the official category used by UNESCO is actually choir singing. It is interesting to speak of the challenges that are to there to categorizing, as this is not an all aggregated term. In fact, not all examples of collective singing can be found under the definition Biasing. Other UNESCO aggregating concepts that speak to the world of collective singing would be polyphonic singing or vocal music, under which Gregorian polyphonic singing or the Klapa multi-part singing of Dalmatia are listed, without being actually included in the choir singing category. However, and continuing now to look at UNESCO's choir singing, this musical practice involves a group of people singing together in harmony. This is how they, uh, UNESCO defines it. Uh, as we know, it has been a part of human culture for thousands of years and is found in different cultures and traditions around the world. It is one of the most significant ways in which music is created and performed. Choral music places a strong emphasis on building a sense of community again, community, and its practice involves group singing rather than a virtual performance. Once again, this is how UNESCO defines it. The themes of tra or traditions maintained throughout history using the vessel of song are experienced and, 
formed as a community and they are celebrated as a shared experience. Collective singing brings together people. They, it promotes social cohesion and it helps to preserve and transmit cultural traditions from one generation to the next again. With this in mind, I will now try to present uh, you some of examples of what is listed as intangible cultural heritage practices that relate to the world of collective singing. And I will not speak about those practices that will be presented by my co-presenters. In the following map, you will notice all the collective singing practices listed as intangible cultural heritage categorized under choir singing. And the ones tied to polyphonic singing on the next slide. I would like to point out that although Baltic song celebrations are wonderfully rich and meaningful example of collective singing as bearer of identity and of community building, my colleagues will uh, later speak on them. So I will not speak about them. So I will delve deeper into some other examples that hopefully illustrate the variety and representativity that choral music can embody as a vessel for cultural identity. These examples were chosen from UNESCO's listing of intangible cultural heritage. Um, and again, uh, I would like to remind that uh, when I speak about listings, UNESCO has a number of lists under the convention lists and designations that represent their endeavors to promote sustainable development, peace and culture. Um, maybe you also know of other listings of UNESCO, the World Heritage List, there's a list of the Biosphere Reserves, there's the Network of Creative Cities and the Memory of the World Registry. Among these UNESCO's listings of intangible cultural heritage, gather a compendium of the different oral and intangible treasures of humankind worldwide. The three examples you can now see were chosen from these listings and as such the information I will now share is based on the UNESCO page uh, and the nomination form that the community presented for recognition as intangible heritage under the 2003 convention. First of all, the Byzantine chant. This was listed in 2019 and is an example of choir singing listed for the way it connects the community with their own identity and religious practice. Next slide, please. And I think we can listen to some music. In the nomination for the list of representative works, the Byzantine chant is a living, presented as a living art form that has existed for over 2000 years. This broad system developed in the Byzantine Empire, highlighting the litur liturgical texts of the Greek Orthodox Church. It is inseparably linked with spiritual life and religious worship, exemplifying the Byzantine and post-Byzantine spirit and culture. Truly every aspect of this tradition serves the dissemination and the reception of the sacred message. So there's a strong focus on the logos, the, the word. It is rooting, it is a rooting part of European culture as it is directly related to ancient Greek and medieval music. The music is often used to accompany religious services, creating a sense of sacredness and reverence. This chant is passed on orally from generation to generation, maintaining its central characteristics over the centuries. It is exclusively vocal and essentially monophonic. A group of singers, typically led by a cantor, 
dancing in harmony, a series of repeated melodic phrases, creating a kind of call and response effect. This style of singing encourages active participation and engagement from the entire group, fostering a sense of unity and community. You see in the nomination, the, um, the, the nominating uh, uh, communities try to really respond to the criteria of the definition under the 2003 convention. The melodies, rhythms, and modes of Byzantine chant are not written down in a fixed form, but are constantly evolving as they are performed by different groups of singers. The trainees are taught by listening to their masters who transmit the knowledge. The transmission of the art form from generation to generation is done following specific modes of apprenticeship, where churches are the main place of transmission. Beyond the church, the Byzantine chart, chant is flourishing due to the musicians, the choir members, the composers, the musicologists, and scholars dedicated to its study, performance, and dissemination. The community learns it since they are children. They go to church often, and the tradition is passed down by family members. The music is a way of life carried out from childhood and preserved as long as they live. It accompanies their lives until they die. And we go to the next uh, um, example. And the, next, and the next slide, please. The next one. The grand song of the Dong ethnic group. I don't know whether you have heard about it. So the grand song of the Dong ethnic group is an example of how music can be a true vessel for information, disseminating culture from generation to generation. Let's listen to the short example. The Dong is an ethnic group with a long and unique cultural history living in China in the mountainous areas of Yizhou. As they used uh, to have no writing system, their culture and knowledge was passed down through singing in what is called the Grand Songs, which are a form of polyphonic music and they include the group's vocal narratives and they serve to disseminate and edify the history and culture of the Dong through recreation. A popular saying among the Dong people states that rice nourishes the body and songs nourish the soul, which summarizes the precious value they embed onto music. There is a strong tradition of passing on culture and knowledge, as well as people's sentiments and virtues through music. The grand song singing is based, is based on mass community and serves a great pragmatic and artistic function. It acts as a carrier of Dong's culture, publicly praising their heritage and examining culture through song. The grand song is a form of multi-part singing a cappella, performed without instrumental accompaniment. Sorry, I think I muted Silvia, Silvia by mistake, trying to mute somebody else. <laughs> okay, <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Um, sorry, how many minutes do I have left just to check? To check maybe five and we okay. are... Perfect. So uh, grand songs are taught by experienced masters to acquire of disciples, disciples, and they act as young people's encyclopedia as they narrate the history, they praise the belief in the unity between humanity and nature, they disseminate scientific knowledge, sing the honest love between men and women, and advocate social virtues like respecting the elders and taking good care of one's neighbor. The grand song engages all members of the community at different ages, 
and it is a carrier and disseminator of the Dong people's lifestyle, the social structure, their moral customs, their wisdom, and another important and any other important cultural related information. It reflects the kindness, unity, and harmony of this ethnic group. The grand song is currently widely performed as each village boasts various choirs divided by age and sometimes also by gender. As well as disseminating the lifestyle and wisdom of the Dong, it is a crucial symbol of their identity and cultural heritage and their way of sharing their spiritual fortune with the world. For our third example, let's travel to La Réunion Island and explore Maloya. Maloya was formerly present in Wright and as a cultural heritage expression, it is referenced more for its political dimension in documenting the community's history. Let's listen to some music. Maloya is a type of music, uh, song and dance that originated in Réunion Island and represents the culture and the identity of the region. It was created by Malagasy and African slaves on sugar plantations, becoming creolized over time. Many contributions from the populations after the ab abolition of slavery shaped this art form, which is later adopted by the whole island population. Maloya nowadays is presented in various forms and is mixed with different genres, including rock, reggae, or jazz, and it inspires poetry and slang. I actually uh, witnessed a very um, contemporary interpretation of Maloya last weekend at the Babel Music XP uh, conference and showcases where a group uh, reinterpreted uh, Maloya and actually added to it also a, a Chora, which originally does not belong to this form of, uh, of expression. The traditional form of Maloya involves alternate singing between soloists and choruses and is accompanied by drums, rattles, rattles and idiophones. Historically, it was initially performed in a ritual context called Dervis Maldas or Dervis Cabaret, where animals were sacrificed as offerings to honor the Malagasy or African ancestors. These songs were used to initiate communication with ancestors and they were used to keep some of the participants in a state of possession. Although originally dedicated to ancestral worship as part of a ritual, Maloya eventually became a song of lament against slavery. It was performed during festive evenings in the past where it eventually became a major vector for cultural and political demands. And it also served the purpose of identity building. The songs included criticism and social commentary becoming an aspect of social regulation within the communities of sugar plantation workers. The cultural creolization that took place in the context of sugar plantation led to the Indian and French cultural influences that can be noted also in Maloya, their melodies, sagas, myths, and rituals. Today, it is kept alive by around 300 documented groups and it's even taught at the Conservatoire uh, of uh, La Réunion. Every cultural, political, and social event on the island is currently accompanied by Maloya, which became a real vehicle for assertion and political rights. For the past 30 years, it has represented the island's identity, and it is an essential part of the music and cultural scene in the island. It plays a significant role in promoting tolerance, solidarity, and openness. The high point of Maloya's visibility comes on the 20th of December, which is the anniversary of the abolition of slavery in La Réunion. 
the social and cultural shifts that have occurred in La Réunion in the past 30 years, including the decline of the plantation economy and the emergence of a middle class, have undermined the historical basis of Maloyan music. Nevertheless, it has become the expression, as I said, of an entire population, and it resisted slavery, it resisted colonialism, and it has been a factor of resistance to cultural assimilation efforts. The works composed with artists from other countries illustrate the exemplary qualities and the openness and dialogue that is inherent in the Maloya tradition. As you can observe, choral singing serves a multitude of purposes and is present in the most varied types of context. It serves as a tool for connection and transmission of values, knowledge, and ideas. I am very grateful for having been given the possibility to share some of the examples selected from the world of collective singing within the UNESCO's listings of intangible cultural heritage. Thank you again for the invitation to speak at the seminar. I'm eager, uh, as you are, to hear more about the other uh, celebrations, the, the other expressions of intangible cultural heritage, more from the European continent. And maybe uh, later I can also uh, talk about the national inventories, which might be of interest to you. Thank you very much. Celia, thank you for your very nice and detailed presentation. Um, I'm inviting all our um, guests, uh, uh, participants. Do we have any questions? Maybe someone would like to ask something, Celia? Or maybe the discussion will develop at the very end of the all three presentations. If anyone has question, just raise your hand electronically in the Zoom. If you don't have questions. There is one question in the chat. Yeah. From Bezim Bla. Bezim, yeah. you want to ask the question live or I see the question. Yes, maybe you uh, can about Albanian traditional idol polyphony. Yes, uh, of course, it's it's part of uh, of uh, UNESCO cultural heritage uh, listings. Um, uh, I I didn't choose this one. I really wanted to choose uh, um, examples that would not be uh, specifically European. So, but uh, I mean, there are many, many, many elements on this list. Please, please. Uh... I'd like also to add something that uh, it is a similarity uh, with the uh, Albanian traditional isopolyphony that is also like similarity in Corsica and uh, in uh, Sardinia. It's a, like a feeling, it's my opinion. Yes, I Thank think you, as. Thank you very much for, for sharing this. Uh, as one can see, there are a lot of uh, uh, connections between uh, the uh, expressions of, of uh, collective heritage expressions. Uh, and uh, thank you for pointing out these similarities with uh, other uh, traditions uh, that refer to collective singing. Thank you very much, Mr. Petrela, for this. Yes, thank you. I know Mr. Besson, he comes from Albania. I know that his institution is taking care of um, uh, their um, intangible cultural heritage. So maybe at the very end, Mr. Besson can share something from Albania with us. But now I propose that we move on uh, to more, um, more practical uh, presentations um, and so we will listen how Coral Singer has United Nations and helped them to preserve their culture and constitute their countries. And this is the example from three Baltic states. And I'm also very interested to learn um, about the three Baltic song celebrations. Today is with us Mr. Yanis, and would, I would just like to invite him to tell us where and how it all started. Yanis, the word yes. is yours. Hello. Hello everyone, I'm very happy to be here, so thank you for inviting me. And also I'm happy that uh, uh, more and more people around the world wants to know uh, 
uh, about uh, our Baltic uh, tradition. So I will try to um, point some points and uh, in these 15 minutes uh, to for you to understand what it is and uh, how we do that. So I will now switch my um, screen or share the... I hope that you see this, yeah? Yes. You can see that, okay. So I start. A phenomenon exists each of the Baltic countries that exists nowhere else in Europe, a national song festival that comes across like the Olympics of music. The very concept of the song festival, despite its ties to traditional culture, was derived from the song fest movement when German men choirs in the first half of the 19th century performed in Germany, Austria and Switzerland. It was only in the later half of the century that the concert format slowly began to develop in the Baltic region. The first German Songfest in Latvia was a two-day event held in 1861 with 21 choirs comprising of about 600 men. Following the original German Songfest, the Estonian National Song Festival began in 1869, the Latvian Song Festival in 1873, while in Lithuania it was delayed until 1924. The mid-19th century was a time of great social change in the Baltic region. The emancipation of the peasants became a legal reality in 1861, while the industri industrial uh, revolution was in full swing, and many free peasants became urbanized. The rise of the city meant a rise in intellectual capital and along with it, the nationalist aspirations of those living in the Baltic region. The countries of Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania, as we know them today, were at this time the political possessions of Tsarist Russia. However, the administrative system was in the hands of the Baltic Germans, dissidents of the German colonists who had conquered and settled the region in the Middle Ages. Over 700 years of history, they perceived themselves as a privileged society uh, greater than the lower class, Latvians, Estonians, uh, Lithuanians. This social and political hold began to break when Latvia, Latvian political and cultural activists pushed forward the so-called national awakening, uh, nationalist movement, and that happened also in Est Estonia and Lithuania. A national movement of self-empowerment that would eventually result in the creation of the republics of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. As you can imagine, I'm not expert in Estonian and Lithuanian song festivals because we're three uh, countries. Uh, so I mostly will talk about Latvian song festival, but as our history is so connected, the process was almost the same except that Lithuanian Song Festival started a little bit later, some 50 years later. But still, if I say uh, in Latvia or Latvia, that could mean also Estonia and Lithuania. I would like to split the Latvian Song celebrations in four periods. First period from the beginnings until all three Baltic countries got their independence. That happened in 1918, uh, 1990. The second period when all three Baltic countries were independent, that was until 1940. And these both periods, I think, was the time when all three Baltic states focused on their own traditions, on compositions, on composers, making a heritage of now. Third period, Soviet Union times when we had to sing all nice songs from all USSR friendly nations, but still we got also a chance to sing the folk songs that we knew and loved. Actually, in this time, 1948, also dancing tradition started in Latvia. And in 1960, youth song and dance festival started to happen. So this was the chance once in five years to wear our national costumes and feel the community and be united to walk on the streets with our national costumes to sing our folk songs and to not forget who we are. And the last period, fourth period, is again when the all three Baltic states got their independence back. And this was a time when we say that we call it singing revolution. So the song festival helped a lot in Soviet times to remember our roots 
and in 1990s, the same place where song festival was taking the place, major parks, we had our meetings, manifestations, we sang there all together. And actually, that's also one of the reasons why we call this singing revolution. Now we are free again. We can sing whatever we like. Of course, we focus on heritage, on our own culture, on folk songs, on composers, Latvian composers, and also a lot of composers who emigrated from Latvia. They continued to compose, to write music, being a refugee. And this is also what we continue to remember. And of course, new songs and dances arises. And now a little bit about Soviet times. The Soviet occupation after World War II brought in a whole new era in the history of the song festival. Rather than eliminating the song festival tradition altogether, the Soviet authorities transformed and used it as an instrument of propaganda. In addition, a new stage was built in uh, 1955 in what is known uh, now as mesh parks. The song festival became a tool to propagate the image of uh, Latvian people in throes of a fortunate, happy new life. To further this image, the Soviet ideal of a brotherhood of peoples meant the inclusion of many foreign ethnic musical scores in the festival repertoire. The result was an ide ideological instrument designed to express the greatness of Soviet power. This was aptly demonstrated at the 18th Song Festival in 1980, when soldiers with Kalashnikov automats rifles marched across the stage. The Latvian music community could do little to change matters. At least for most singers and musicians, the sense of collective unconsciousness transcended time and space, reaching beyond Soviet superficiality and into the ancient roots of the folk melodies upon which the festival was originally founded. Now you see a very fresh photo of me with the Latvians. Uh, actually, I was uh, this weekend uh, in London and worked with uh, Irish and Latvian choirs because also they are preparing for a big event which we'll have this year. So this was from Sunday. And um, uh, I will talk about our diaspora. So Latvian diaspora around the world proves that collective singing and dancing is our natural format. Even when away from home, temporarily or permanently, Latvians form choirs and dance groups in their new countries of residence as a way of maintaining Latvianness and emotional ties with Latvia. Among those 150,000 Latvians who fled the country during World War II and initially ended up in displaced person camps in Germany, there were many popular musicians, composers, and conductors. To keep the spirit up and unite the Latvian refugee commun community, song days were organized at the camps, sowing the seed for future Latvian song celebrations in exile. The first refugee Latvian song celebration took place um, in 1947 in Esslingen, Germany, with a thousand singers and 10,000 spectators, followed by song festivals in USA, Chicago, Seattle, San Francisco, Boston, Milwaukee, Canada, and uh, also in Australia, the Latvian annual cultural days, which are happening uh, every two years, uh, also this year it will be. Uh, there are about 370,000 Latvians living in 120 um, countries around the world, and the number of diaspora choirs and dance groups taking part in the celebration in Riga has reached a thousand. Many of their members are spouses to Latvians and have become passionate converts to the Latvian cultural tradition. And actually, you don't have to be Latvian or married to one uh, to love uh, choir singing. Uh, in 2018, there were two foreign choirs in our um, song celebration taking part um, uh, one was uh, Gaisma from Japan, real Japan people, not Latvians. And the second actually was from Estonia, from a neighbor country, Tartu University Chamber Choir. So those choirs 
choirs also learn the festival repertoire and sing in Latvian. Yeah. And this year we will celebrate our 150 years anniversary of the festival and we will have also one choir from Ukraine. Singers and dancers, as we see. Choir singers are the key element of the celebration. They usually group in formations of 20 to 50 people, making up men's, women's, or mixed choirs. Controlled and di directed by a conductor, a choir is a platform not only for cultivating talent, but also for socializing. For each festival, choir singers learn about 20 to 40 new songs of by heart. Those who cannot read scores learn their part by ear. In Latvia, the ability to sing is probably the most useful of talents, uh, as it can be applied anywhere, um, at any time. Parties, weddings, funerals, because the instrument and the voice is always there. Folk dancers, they represent the physical aspect of our heritage, the manifestation of vitality and love of life. Folk dancers come in pairs, as our dancing tradition is mostly for and about couples. Today, there are about 800 uh, dance groups um, formed of 8, 16, 24, or 32 members, divided by age, young, middle-aged, and senior. Each dancer knows 15 dances on average. Principal conductors of the song and dance celebration are selected from among professional conductors and choir leaders in a lengthy process which, which takes place before every festival. There are also honorary principal conductors, a title assigned for life to those who have made a significant contribution during their lifetime to the process of song celebration. One of them, Robert Zuika, took part in the closing concert in 2013 at the age of one hundred and it's actually it could be a guinness record i think nobody did that before um and in the olden days principal conductors were often thrown up in the air by the singers as a sign of immense adoration and honor even uh, though dance directors are less visible to the general audience than the conductors they are like magicians Dance directors possess multidimensional thinking to envisage complex dance patterns and the way how individual dancers can create them with certain dance steps and choreographic methods. Precise mathematics is required to calculate the necessary amount of dancers on the stadium and the optimal distances between them in order to create the designed ornaments. All dances are schematically depicted on paper with five to six drawings per dance, allocating a 64 square meter plot per dance group. The result is a visually and emotionally impressive performance. And of course, uh, in this um, song celebration, I even, uh, I, I even don't have time to talk about our um, wind orchestras, about our national instrument kuokle ensembles and all the folk groups. So it's a huge, huge event and not only in Latvia also in Estonia and Lithuania and this year we will celebrate our 150 years anniversary and uh, um, after COVID it seems that we are all fine uh, the, we have 16,000 singers 70,000 um, dancers uh, altogether the participants uh, are 40,000 plus um, so it's a huge, 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 and we built a new open air stage, and it now it's for sixteen thousand singers. So previous stage, which uh, built Soviets in nineteen fifty five, was for uh, twelve thousand people. So this is for sixteen, and you can imagine that you can put more some four and five thousand in the front of the stage. So this will be huge. And um, this will be this year. So uh, I warmly invite you to uh, do Mission Impossible to buy tickets to this event and to come to Latvia. But of course, not only this uh, big event will be, there are many events all the, uh, all the week. So you can come and just be with us 
be with Latvians, Lithuanians, and Estonians. And in the end of my um, presentation, I want to uh, show you also a uh, small, uh, small uh, short video. Uh, that it will be maybe more easier than understand what I'm talking about. So I try to do like this. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you see the video? Yeah, okay. You can see it, yeah. Okay, then I will play it, yeah. That's all, folks. Come to Latvia. Thank you, Yanis. Bravo. I, I, I think we can. To, yeah. And uh, you have to excuse me because I, I really need to run to my uh, okay. rehearsal. So have a good uh, rest of the day and see you next time somewhere. Thank you, Yanis, again for a great uh, presentation. I think we can only congratulate to all three countries to all organizers, fire singers, dancers, conductors for your achievements and the effort you put into preserving and developing these great celebrations that really demonstrates to the whole world the power of chorus singing. Thank you, Yanis, and hope to meet you soon. Bye-bye.
So now to conclude, I invite Eva Krevitskaya from Lithuanian National Cultural Center to introduce us the Lithuanian song celebration, which will be marking its 100th anniversary in 2024. Eva, I think we are all eager to hear your presentation and find out what uh, you plan for 2024. Hello, Eva. Hi, hi, thank you so much. Um, thank you to Yanis, who I think already left. It was so beautiful. It's so nice. And uh, I mean, every single time we witness uh, each other's celebrations in the Baltic States, I think we are just filled with such pride. It's it's so nice to share this tradition among the, the three countries. It's I think it even makes it uh, more special, uh, so to say, that we are sharing this. Um, so uh, I will be uh, talking about the Lithuanian uh, song celebration today. Uh, and uh, I will be talking about it um, in terms of the celebration turning 100 uh, next year in 2024. Uh, I am um, the head of communications at the celebration and uh, I am a lifelong choir singer myself. So it's um, a very special uh, work to have, to be honest, and it's a very special thing to be talking about. I um, absolutely love it. I think um, for us uh, in the Baltic states, of course, it's something um, you know that is very natural and very beautiful. But I think um, there is a lot to be gained uh, for people coming to see it, coming to witness it, coming to sing together as well. There's no need to you know learn the whole twenty songs. You can just come and be there in the audience and sing um, a couple of uh, choruses with us. And uh, that's what I am going to invite you to do. Um, so the Lithuanian song celebration is uh, a bit smaller in numbers than the Latvian one. It has around 30,000 active participants, uh, which means uh, choir singers, dancers, uh, instrument players, um, theater people, and so on. We uh, count that we have more than 1 million spectators every time when the celebration happens. Um, that's counting both the people who come live to the events and both uh, those who tune in on the national television, because, of course, the event is broadcasted for everyone who cannot come. It's uh, Similar, uh, like Yanis said, it's a full week of events. So it's not just the whole big gathering of choirs, but it's also many other uh, beautiful events that are also very interesting to uh, witness. The main event, um, the finale of the whole week is the Song Day, which features a choir of around 12,000 singers in our case. And uh, the celebration, as Yanis said, uh, officially started in 1924 in Lithuania, but uh, its roots date back to the 19th century. Not only uh, Switzerland and Germany and Lithuania too, uh, the roots for the movement were uh, much earlier than 1924, but the 1924 celebration is where we count um, kind of the beginning of, of ours, the official start, so to speak. And so the thing that will probably attract most of you to the Lithuanian song celebration is, of course, the song day and this huge, uh, beautiful um, choir. So now I will uh, invite you to try and um, listen to what the Lithuanian um, combined choir sounds like and what it feels like, because it's, of course, not only about singing, it's also about being together and it's also about um, you know, being extremely proud of being there. So I hope that um, the little video that I will play to you now will convey the, the feeling somehow. Yeah. 
Jūs aplodismentai dirigentas Vytautas Miškinis. Skambėjo, kur gyrė žaliuoja Juozo Gudavičiaus muzikas, Savero Sakalausko vanagėlio žodžiai. So, um, I mean, I still get uh, chills, even though I have seen um, this video, I don't know how many times I have been there, I don't know how many times, but um, it's still somehow emotional every single time. Uh, and in order to understand why it's so emotional uh, for me and for so many of us in the Baltic States and in Lithuania, it's uh, quite important, I think, to uh see what the historical context is and uh, to see what lithuania as a country uh, so to speak is all about so um you may know lithuania um as a small a little country near the baltic sea you may not even know where it is uh, and that's completely normal it's okay you can find it on google maps um and uh, the lithuania has not always been uh, the small um in the 13th to 18th century, the country was uh, much, much bigger, as you see uh, on the map on my slide, uh, marked in green. That's, uh, that's the Grand uh, Duchy of Lithuania at its biggest at around 15th century. And then the Grand Duchy of Lithuania was a, a part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth um, during 16th uh, to 18th century. So that means that we had a combined um, country with the Polish. And then the country lost its independence in 1794, and it uh, fell to the rule of the Russian Empire, where it stayed until the 20th century. And then Lithuania regained its independence in 1918, but that only lasted until 1940, when we were occupied by the Soviet Union and we were under their occupation until 1990 when we uh, regained our independence and have stayed independent since. And uh, the song celebration started, um, well, officially started, so to speak, during the interwar independence period. So um, the whole, um, the whole history and the whole um, context of the song celebration is very closely and very intricately related for us to our um, independence and to our struggle for independence. Um, and uh, I will now um, talk about the whole history of the Lithuanian song celebrations because we are marking 100 years anniversary um, next year. So it, it's also very interesting for us to see how it changed and how it uh, developed through the years. So um, as I said, the first celebration um, started in 1924 and it uh, officially hosted 77 choirs. Uh, what was interesting about this celebration is, is that pawns were dug to uh, amplify the sound. You can see it uh, on the picture just now. I mean, they didn't have the microphones that we have now. Um, and harmonized folk songs and uh, original compositions were performed. The president that you see now attended the celebration and tens of thousands of uh, spectators gathered to see it and to witness um, the event um, taking place for the first time to this extent. The second one coincided with the 10-year anniversary of Lithuanian independence. And uh, although the government did not uh, subsidize the celebration somehow significantly, it uh, attracted even more participants than the first one. It was around 6,000 singers. And reportedly, the audience um, loved a lot of the pieces so much that uh, they had to be repeated twice um, so that the audience would be satisfied. Then uh, the third celebration um, was dedicated to the 500th death anniversary of Vytautas, the Grand Duke of Lithuania, if you remember the Grand Duchy that I just told about. Um, and again, this celebration hosted uh, 6,000 choral singers and it included guests, Riga's Lithuania choir from Latvia, a Jewish choir and German choirs, interestingly. And uh, this was the last celebration held in independent Lithuania for quite a while.
And as I mentioned, the Soviet Union occupied Lithuania in 1940. And uh, that's where the tradition uh, was changed quite uh, a bit, but still kept alive both at home and abroad. Expatriates in uh, Western countries, deportees in Siberia, refugees in camps in Germany, they all came together to sing and to uh, satisfy their longing for their home country in that way. North American Lithuanian song celebrations started in 1956 and are still being organized to this day. In Lithuania, during the occupation, the celebrations uh, were expanded and they started including more events such as ensembles, evening, dance day, and so on. A new amphitheater was built and separate school children celebrations started, and they still attract thousands of young singers and dancers today. During the Soviet occupation, the celebration, we think, played a crucial a role in preserving the Lithuanian identity. And to this day, as Yanis mentioned, uh, the Lithuania struggle for independence is internationally known as the singing revolution. And then after we regained independence in 1990, the celebration exploded with patriotic energy. It has become central to our nation's cultural life as uh, we gather to celebrate uh, all of the most important national anniversaries by singing and dancing. For example, the last celebration took place in 2018, and that was a way for us to mark 100 years since our interwar independence that I talked about. And today, the song celebration is a festival of all kinds of amateur art. So next to the song day, there are also theater, wind orchestra, dance, folk group performances. And what is interesting is that every year on the 6th of July, at exactly 9 p.m. Lithuanian time, Lithuanians all across uh, the globe stand up to sing our national anthem. And that is how we traditional finish the song uh, celebration with our song traveling uh, across the globe that way. And of course, uh, it's important to mention that the song celebration is not just an event. It is years and years of rehearsals, of music writing, and of policy making. It uh, was enlisted um, as the Baltic Song and Dance Celebrations on the UNESCO list of intangible cultural heritage of humanity in 2003. And in 2007, a special law protecting the song celebration was passed in Lithuania to make sure that the tradition lives on and is protected for the future generations. Um, so basically, uh, Looking from an outsider's perspective, it might seem that it's a crazy thing to organize and it's a crazy thing to keep alive. Um, and uh, it's, it is kind of crazy. And uh, there are a lot of people involved um, in making sure that the celebration continues and that the celebration uh, happens smoothly. Uh, so uh, the Lithuanian National Culture Center is the organizer of the celebration. Uh, and the Lithuanian municipalities from across the country coordinate their delegations, making sure that uh, singers, dancers, and instrument players from different towns get to the capital, Vilnius, in time for the big event. Uh, each event of the celebration has separate artistic and organizational teams. And uh, as I've mentioned, and um, as I want to really stress, it's a process, it's a tradition, it's not just an event. And uh, of course, what I really want to uh, finish with and what I really want to uh, invite you to do is to come and witness uh, the celebration yourself. The next one, the super special one, the centenary one uh, is taking place in 2024 from June 29th to July 6th. And we will have uh, an international study tour it will be coordinated by um, the European Choral Association board member, Silvia Prochkita, who is a Lithuanian. And um, you will have opportunities to meet the creators, the organizers, visit rehearsals, look into backstage, see all the main events. The study tour will be a bit shorter than the entire celebration because it's an entire week, but we will make sure to uh, pick the date so that you can see everything that you have to see and of course to see the song day 
And the registration to the study tour will start at the beginning of 2024. So do keep an eye out for that. Uh, the European Choral Association will be featuring um, the invitation on their uh, channels. And uh, I want to finish with um, a one minute video um, seeing, uh, showing you what to expect in 2024 in case you're still not convinced somehow. Let me just play that for you. I am a pine tree, the most common tree in Lithuania, and this is my voice. You haven't heard it before. But if I could speak, what would I tell you? For a hundred years, I have been listening to your songs, observing your dances, and how I wish that you could hear me too. That your love for my lux would grow into your oath to protect me. July 2024 is when we will meet, where man and nature are one, where learning about culture means learning to cherish life. The centennial Lithuanian song and dance celebration Green forest forever. Lithuania is waiting for you. So uh, here are my contact details. Uh, here is the website for the song celebration. Do not worry, it does have um, an English version as well. And I hope to see all of you, or maybe at least some of you next year in Lithuania. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yeva. Thank you for a great presentation. I guess we came to the end of all three and all three were fantastic. I think that above all, they were inspiring. So if you have questions, now is the time to discuss what you would like to ask Celia and Eva. Are there any questions or comments or would anyone like to say something? I think there are no questions in the chat, only um, thank yous. Thank you, and um, just to repeat for everybody, because we've had some latecomers, um, that uh, the webinar has been streamed on Facebook and you will be able to watch the whole recording on Facebook soon. And later it will also appear in the playlist of our webinars on YouTube. So it doesn't matter if you missed a part of it, you will be able to watch the part you missed. Thank you, Sonia. Yes. If there are no questions, I think I can now um, pass the word to my colleague in communications, Beatrice. Um, she's going to share with us the ways how we can stay in touch also after this webinar and I will share our PowerPoint again. Yeah, so, thank you very much, Yoji. Thank you, uh, everybody, uh, for being here. Uh, it's been a very interesting webinar. Um, and now, if you want to stay in touch, I uh, suggest you to follow us on our social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And as Sonia said, um, also this uh, webinar will be um, available on uh, our Facebook page. And already right after the, um, the streaming, so you can find it um, starting from uh, this evening already if you want to rewatch it and uh, yeah so I kindly suggest you to follow us and then um, we also have a monthly newsletter um, you can subscribe as you see here in the screen uh, through our um, website and every month we publish um, some uh, news on the choral sector, uh, both European and international one. And also we share with you initiative from across uh, the cultural sector and very events opportunities that are um, happening around. So um, subscribe to our newsletter as well. 
And for Anya, yeah, also benefits of singing, you will find it in all our um, communication channels. It's an initiative that we uh, are uh, actually running since uh, more than one year in which we share uh, all the benefits that collective singing can bring. So physical, social, educational, and psychological. If you want to learn more, uh, again, follow us on our channels. And for any other question or whatever, just drop us an email or you can also uh, drop a message through our social media. Thank you very much. Thank you, Beatrice. And thank you all of you for joining us in person or um, on Facebook stream. I hope to see you also in the future webinars. The first opportunity uh, to join us online will be on 17th of May uh, at the same hour, 5 p.m when we'll have the opportunity to listen to renowned artistic director of vocal uh, group Ilfa Golini, Mr. Robert Hollingsworth. Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. We are there for you. And that's all from our side for today. I wish you all a wonderful rest of the evening or the day and see you next time. Thank you, goodbye. Thank Bye. you, Yuri. Thank you, all the speakers. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.